Hi, I'm Michael Pearl, and I am here to answer your Bible questions. So this is right in the middle of my working morning. Beautiful spring morning. And uh, I've got a tool here I need a handle in, a pitchfork. Cost you about 35 bucks for one like that. My handles are all deteriorated, I guess, where I left them outside. You don't ever do that, do you? You don't ever leave your tools outside. <laughs> so, so I went down in the woods and selected some straight poles. This just happens to be uh, dogwood. And so I'll take the draw knife and shave it all off, and then I'll taper it down to fit in there, and I'll put a handle on it. So, but now I'm going to answer your Bible questions. And I uh, got my grandkids sitting there, Jeremiah, behind the camera for me. It's an interesting question. It says, if the King James Version is the correct version for English-speaking people, why do we for... Uh, what do we do for those who speak other languages? Is there a correct Korean? What do we do for people who speak other languages? We translate the Bible into their language and we translate it accurately based on the original Masoretic Hebrew text, which then would be the equivalent, though not exactly because languages differ, uh, the equivalent of the King James Version to us in English speaking. He said, is there a correct Korean, a correct Filipino, a correct French? If they were translated before about the 1880s, then chances are they're very correct. Anything translated after 1900s is most likely going to be corrupted because it's not based on the same Greek manuscript. It's based on a different Greek manuscript that didn't, it wasn't uh, widely known until Westcott and Hart, two unbelieving scholars, in the 1880s, dug up from the Vatican in an old monastery two, verse, two, two uh, copies of the Bible that had been rejected by the church and set aside because of the large number, thousands, literally thousands of errors in it. And West Cotton Hort wanting to discredit Christianity, discredit the Bible, discredit the miraculous, came up with the idea of creating a different Greek original, so-called, so they actually inserted Greek words into their text that didn't exist in any other Greek text. In other words, they invented a new Bible uh, in the 1800s. And so in 1901, American Standard uh, Version uh, came out with, uh, based on this false uh, manuscript, corrupt manuscript. And since then, many versions like the New International Version or Vice Standard Version, all based on the corrupted manuscript. So... Uh, any Bible that was translated from the text Receptus, which, by the way, represents 95% of all Greek manuscripts, 95 plus, maybe 98, some say. So if you go back and start digging around in uh, where a civilization existed in, say, 200 AD and find an old piece of Bible that someone had written down, dig it up and look at it, <laughs> it's going to agree with the King James. Bible. It's going to agree with the text of Septus. It's going to be what was being used in the old Latin, uh, in the old Syriac, old Coptic, all those old ancient versions uh, that the Bible was translated into were translated and read like the King James reads in English. Of course, it'd be in a different language. Uh, so you have to you have to come down to very modern times when unbelieving scholarship has perpetrated a hoax upon the public. Uh, I went to Bible college, studied Greek, and I was absolutely uh, uh, confident that I was uh, really somebody now because I could actually read the Bible in the original Greek language. And uh, uh, so I had all these lexicons and different things that you uh, uh, resort to to find out the meaning of words. And it dawned on me not too far into my Greek studies that I was not reading original Greek that I was just uh, parroting what somebody else in English had told me the Greek words meant. It was just an elaborate way of uh, reading English. And it wasn't until I got out of Bible college that I found out that the Greek Bible, the West Cotton Horts, I think it was 26th edition, 1970, 1966, 67, when I was in Bible college, 
that that uh, gr little Greek Bible, which I've still got, uh, didn't exist until less than 100 years before that, that it was actually manufactured and was not like the original Greek text, that it was based on two manuscripts, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus, dug up by Westcott and Hart. And so when I went back to my Greek professor, I said, well, actually it wasn't a Greek professor, it was one of the other college professors. I said to him, how come you didn't tell me that the Greek Bible that I received in Bible college and told to learn was not the original Greek, that it was a manufactured Greek, uh, comes from the Sinaitics of Vaticanus and not the text of Receptus? He said, huh? And so I said it again. He said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I was amazed that a Bible college professor was not aware of these the, the dickering around with the original Greek Bibles and the hoax that had been per perpetrated. So I began to study the issue. We have a book we sell now called Which Version is the Bible? If you want a very clear understanding of this issue, and it's, it's vast, then you need to get that Which Version is the Bible. Now, just for kicks, uh, I looked up in Wikipedia what they had to say about uh, King James onlyism, it's so-called, which is not King James onlyism, because I have many, many different versions which I resort to, especially if I get bored and need a laugh. So uh, <laughs> I, I use the Greek, I use the Hebrew, I use other languages, and uh, I use other versions if I want to see how they would translate something, think of it in modern language. Uh, so it's not the, it's just that I believe every word in the King James Bible. Now, here's what the Wikipedia said. I thought this was interesting. And uh, you might not believe me if I told you some of these things. And, of course, don't believe everything Wikipedia either. But he says, non-English speakers prefer translations based upon Textus Receptus. That's T-R, Textus Receptus. That's what the King James Bible is translated from. That's the Greek text representing 95% of all uh, extant uh, in libraries, in museums, uh, in private collections uh, of uh, the original Greek Bible. Text Receptus, or so-called received text. Instead of the Alexandrian text, edited by West Cotton Hort in 1881. So the Alexandrian text came from Alexandria, Egypt, where origin about 250 AD, uh, an unbelieving character produced uh, a version of the Bible that he had altered and changed to suit his philosophical perspective. That's the one that all the modern Bibles are based on. Uh, he said, proponents of this belief system point to verses, and he goes on and talks about the Bible verses that said God will preserve his word, not one jot or tittle pass away till the world ends. And uh, then they point out that uh, there's people who actually believe that, that God has preserved his word infallible and it won't pass away. Uh, modern preachers will tell you, yeah, it's preserved in heaven. A lot of good that's going to do us. When the Bible says it's preserved, he's talking about right here on earth. And then he says uh, here in the Wikipedia, most biblical scholars, however, and this is untrue, but he said most biblical scholars, however, believe that knowledge of ancient Greek and Hebrew has improved over the centuries. I ask a rabbi who has a lineage of speaking Hebrew all the way back to the time of Christ. I said, if you had one English version of your Torah, Old Testament, uh, which one would be closest to the original Hebrew, the Hebrew that you've not changed, that you had for uh, 3,500 years? He said, well, the King James. And so <laughs> most Greek and Hebrew scholars do not agree uh, and do not think that it has improved, coupled with advances in the fields of textual criticism and biblical archaeology and linguistics, this has enabled the creation of more accurate translations, which texts are chosen as the basis. Now, that's a lot of mumbo-jumbo, which simply says that now in modern times, we're smarter than people used to be, and we have better manuscripts than they used to have, and so we've now made a better translation than they used to make. The only thing is they make a new translation every nine months. There's over 300 of them in America in the English language, and each one of them differs from the other as much as 10%. So it looks like these scholars would eventually get together and come up with their perfect translation. They've not done it yet. Now, they, there's, there's three different ways of approaching Bible translation, any translation, many languages. The first one is called 
formal equivalents. There's dynamic equivalents, formal equivalents, and that's the main two. Now, if you if you read any archaeology, you will see from time to time they will discover a text, uh, an ancient Greek text, not necessarily a Bible text, just an ancient Greek text. And uh, it'll be on politics or a purchasing or a will somebody wrote. And they will translate it, and it reads much like the King James text would read because it's a word-for-word -word translation. It's not a modern equivalent. Uh, in a modern equivalent translation, some of them will take the word where it says Jesus is the Lamb of God in foreign languages, and they'll translate it Jesus is the pig of God because pigs, lambs are unknown, pigs are known, and pigs are sacrificed to their gods, and so they change it to Jesus is the pig of God. So that's a, that's a dynamic equivalent. It's equivalent in their culture, in their society. Much of your English Bibles are translated that way to try to be equivalent to modern thinking. In so doing, they lose the original meaning of the text. So he says, a literal translation tries to, and that's what the King James is, a literal translation, tries to main, remain as close to the original text as possible. Hmm. <laughs> Anything wrong with that? without adding the translator's ideas and thoughts into the translation. Sounds pretty good to me. Thus, the argument goes, the more literal the translation is, the less danger there is of corrupting the original message. <laughs> Sounds good to me. This is, this is therefore much more of a word-for-word -word view of translation, that is the King James Bible, the, dynamic, the formal equivalent, uh, is much more of a word-for-word -word translation. The problem with this form of translation, so now we're going to find the problem with the way the King James is translated, is that it assumes a more moderate degree of familiarity with the subject matter on the part of the reader. In other words, the problem with the King James translation is it assumes that you're familiar with the words and the language and the culture of that era, of that people. So they feel it's necessary since you're ignorant and you can't uh, type into Wikipedia or to uh, Google and say, what uh, uh, is an EPOD, uh, since the Bible speaks of that, or what is a diadem. Since you can't do that, they're going to translate that for you in a language that you can understand, something you pick up on the street on a daily basis. I'm telling you, when they get through, it's not a Bible anymore. Then he says the New American Standard Bible, and so forth. I'll, I'll skip all that. A whole lot, you can read it yourself uh, in Wikipedia. Now, here's the dynamic equivalent. A dynamic equivalent, or he puts in parentheses, free translation. So that's your modern Bibles, a free translation. The, in other words, the translator's free to depart from the original word-for-word -word text and impart his meaning, what he thinks it means. A free translation tries to clearly convey the thoughts and ideas of the source text. You see, when I say, what did God say? I don't want to filter that through someone else's thoughts and interpretation as to what he meant. If it's not clear, leave it unclear. Let the Holy Spirit guide me. Let me search the scriptures and find out what it said. Don't tell me. Don't, when there's three or four possibilities, uh, when a text reads and it's ambiguous, don't exclude three of those and just give me one that you think it is. Here's what happened. One translation takes this interpretation. Another translation takes that interpretation. Another translation takes that interpretation. Each one of your translators take different approaches and have different ideas to what the text means. So you end up with six translations in front of you with six different meanings. Just give me the King James Bible with all the meanings inherent within it and let me resolve it through my Bible study. He said, a dynamic equivalent free translation tries to clearly convey the thoughts and ideas of the source text. A little translation, it is argued, may obscure the intention of the original author. Huh. So he's going to tell me what the in intention of the original author was. A free translation attempts to convey the sub subtleties of context and subtext in the work so that the reader is presented with both a translation of the language and the context. Can you see that they admit that the modern Bibles are tampered with and altered 
and modified so that they're going to help you understand what they understand it to be saying. The New Living Translation is an example of translations that use dynamic equivalents. The New National Version attempts to strike a balance between the dynamic equivalent uh, and uh, so forth, so forth. Uh, the New National Version is one of the <laughs> biggest erroneous uh, translations of all. I mean, th things like the Living Bible, that's not even an attempt to be a translation, although some people think it is. Now, here's the functional equivalence. This is the third way that uh, translators approach the text. The functional equivalence or thought-for-thought thought translation goes even further than dynamic equivalence. Thought-for-thought thought means the, the, the uh, translator reads it in the Hebrew, Greek, or whatever, and he says, hmm, what's the thought he's trying to convey? Okay, let me, let me rewrite that for you. And so he rewrites what the original wrote and gives you the thought that they were trying to convey. You know, the Bible is not that easy just to sit down and What's, the, what's he conveying? You've got, a, you've got a whole lot of cross-references sometimes you have to go through. Don't, don't cut me out of that process. Don't give me something you call a Bible that's not what God said originally, that is rather an interpretation of what you think he said. Uh, he says, uh, Diamond equivalent attempt to give the meaning of the entire phrase, sentence, or even passage, rather than individual words. So they admit it's not a translation of individual words. It is a thought-for-thought, idea-for-idea conveyance of what they think it means, okay? Then he says, and this is in the Wikipedia, contrast of formal and dynamic equivalence. This is what Wikipedia says. Those who prefer formal equivalence, King James Version, believe that a literal translation is better since it is closer to the structure of the original. You know, a lot of people blame the structure of the King James Bible on ancient English. It's not at all. If you were to approach the translation of the Greek text today and translate it from an English, not an American English, but an English English perspective, it would come out exactly like the King James does now with the exception of a few things. Yes, the these and thous would be in there because they have a purpose. Uh, the uh, e, uh, Believeth would be in there because it has a purpose. We won't go into that now. So he said, those who prefer equivalence, a formal equivalence, believe the little translation is better since it is closer to the structure of the original. Those who prefer dynamic equivalence, like the Living Bible, suggest that a freer translation is better since it is more clearly communicates the meaning of the original. It doesn't communicate the meaning of the original. It, it presents the interpretation of the person who read the original. Those who prefer formal equivalents also argue that some ambiguity of the original text is usually ironed out by the translators. Some of the interpretation work is already done. So he admits that the interpretation work is already done in the modern translation. People say the modern translations are easier to understand. The reason they're easier to understand is because a, a modern individual with a limited perspective has given you what he thinks it means and excludes all other possibilities. So when you read through it, it reads more like a newspaper than it does the words of God. Uh, he cuts out all the cultural connotations, cuts all that out and makes it just a modern street speak language. And that's why they differ. The, the doctrines that you get out of the New International Version are not the same doctrines you'd get from the King James Bible. All right, there's much more that could be said, but you need to get our book, uh, Which Version is the Bible? Uh, I've got a hundred good books like that written by very uh, intelligent scholars. Uh, a guy named Wilson, I think he said he spoke 39 languages. Uh, Dean Bergen, uh, Hill. Uh, I tell you, books by um, Gail Ripplinger are great. Her book, uh, which we also, I think, uh, sell, is called um, "In Awe of Thy Word." Now, it's not a first; it's not for the for the first timers. You need to get uh, which version of the Bible. But if you it, uh, once you get that one, the next one you need to read is "In Awe of Thy Word." Uh, also, New Age Bible versions is a good one. She's got. 
Uh, there are plenty, plenty others. Uh, just go online, look them up, and uh, become a student. Don't go around like a sheep believing what you, what I say or somebody else says. Look into the subject yourself, which is what I did after I got out of Bible college. All right, that's all for that. Let me get back to making some hoe handles. That's about ready to go right there. Need a little sanding and taper it so it'll fit into the fork. I think we can use the draw knife on it now. Okay, here we are. We're gonna use the draw knife now to, to taper this some more. And this is not the best. It's best if you have a table made for a draw knife. But I don't do this often enough. I had a table at one time. And I wore it out or lost it or rotted on me. I don't remember. It's been 50 years. This draw knife will do a nice job of rounding it off and finishing it up. I got it clamped down at the other end. And the clamp right here. I just have to stop and roll it over. But that puts a real nice, clean taper on it. You get me a pilot hole. All right, I think we have the hole in there deep enough now. And, yep. And... So we're ready to drive this on and then drive this into it. And we will have a handle on our fork. So let's go do that. Will be now. I'll just lubricate the stick here. All right. That's going to go on good now, I think. Let's go over here and pound it on. All right, drive it down in there now. Ha ha, da da da. 